Hey, welcome and thank you for joining. My name is Trixie Thibodeau, Health Educator for Community Health at Atlantic Health System. Today's webinar, What You Should Know About the HPV Vaccine, and being presented by Yurani Smy. Uh, this, before we begin, I have a couple of announcements. This webinar will be recorded and will be shared in its entirety on our website. All participants are muted. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A button and use the chat feature for comments. We will try to get through all the questions at the end of the presentation. Are you or a loved one interested in smoking cessation? Atlantic Health Systems offers a quick, free quick uh, smoking program. This program includes an individual assessment, free nicotine replacement products, and six weekly group meetings to help you quit and stay smoke free. There are multiple dates and times available with groups available in person or virtually. For more information about these groups and other resources or for additional dates and times, please call 1-844-472-8499 and I will also add that to the chat area. So now I'm going to turn it over. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yoreni Syme, and I'm with the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey. I'm the Public Health Program Coordinator, and I provide education on HPV to um, high school, middle school students, um, parents, and providers such as dental provi uh, dental uh, dentists and dental hygienists and other dental providers, as well as um, gynecologists and pediatricians. So um, in addition to that, I also educate the community at large about HPV. So uh, again, if you have any questions about any of the information that I will be sharing today, please hold it for the end of the presentation, and I will be able to answer to the best of my ability. So um, if again, if you guys have any trouble hearing me, please let me know. So before I begin, I just want to share a couple of disclosures. Um, neither the speaker nor the planner have any conflicts to disclose, and funding for this initiative has been provided through a grant to the Partnership for the Maternal uh, and Child Health of Northern New Jersey from the White Hill Foundation. So the, the objectives of today's presentation is that we will be discussing what HPV is, how uh, HPV is transmitted and how it can be prevented, as well as where you can get vaccinated and um, where you can vaccinate your children. So now going in, uh, diving right in, let's talk a little bit about HPV. So HPV stands for human papillomavirus. It is the most common sexually transmitted infection of all. I know that we've heard about many cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, uh, herpes, syphilis, but HPV is actually um, the most common out of all. And most sexually active people will get HPV at some point in their lives. About 90% of the sexually active population will be exposed to HPV at some point in their life. Um, HPV is transmitted through any kind of skin-to-skin -skin contact or any kind of sex, including vaginal, oral, and or anal sex. Um, and also through genital on genital rubbing or touching. So I know that um, a lot of parents have probably heard of HPV through different means such as, you know, billboard, billboards, commercials, family, friends, doctors, and maybe even your child's doctor about recommended vaccines. So um, we know that this is something that we've even seen in, in many commercials. Um, and now we're going to go in depth about what HPV really is, um, what it is and how we can protect ourselves from it. So approximately 79 million people in the United States are currently infected with HPV. And that's many of millions of people just in the United States. More than 42 million people in the U.S. are currently infected with HPV types that can cause disease. Um, about 13 million people, including teenagers, become infected with HPV each year. And so um, this is something that is that can, you know, they can have HPV in their system for many years and not even know that they have it. And so in most cases, HPV does go on, on um, away on its own and it does not cause any health problems. So for example, um, eight out of 10 people 
of people that are exposed to HPV can actually, um, the immune system will actually fight off the infection and it'll be as if HPV was never in the system. However, you know, um, there's always many cases where HPV does linger and when it does and it doesn't go away, it can cause health problems like genital warts and cancer. So um, certain strains of HPV cause 70% of oropharyngeal cancers in the United States, affecting about 11,600 people each year. So that's a really high number of just oropharyngeal cancer cases. And um, there it causes six different types of cancer. So we're going to get into that. And the cancers often take years, even decades, to develop after a person gets HPV. Um, and that's because um, it's a little bit like it's a little bit of a silent killer. So someone can be exposed to HPV when they're very young, as a teenager, as a young adult, and it will lie dormant in the body for many, many years um, up until the case that um, they are diagnosed with pre-cancer or unfortunately even cancer itself. And that is because um, it, doesn't, it doesn't show any signs or symptoms in the body. And so um, these cancers slowly start to develop and uh, the cells uh, mutate and replicate. And um, typically, and unfortunately, that's how people find out that they have that they have HPV is through a cancer diagnosis. And this is what we want to avoid. We um, want to make sure that we are protecting ourselves so we don't get to the point where we are hearing of a cancer diagnosis through our dentists, through our um, gynecologists, or through any other um, of our medical providers. So um, one thing that I want to mention before moving forward is that um, the types of HPV that can cause genital warts are not the same types of HPV that can cause cancers. So while um, I did share that HPV can cause genital warts and it causes cancer, they are not the same thing and genital warts are not cancerous. So while they are very uncomfortable, they have their separate treatment, um, they are not life-threatening and they are not cancerous. So I just want to make sure that that's clear for everyone that um, genital warts are not cancerous, but it is something else that HPV can cause besides the six different types of cancer that it causes. So um, the six different types of cancer that um, genital warts, that uh, HPV can cause are um, cervical, vaginal, vulvar cancer in women. It causes um, penile cancer in men. It causes anal cancer in both men and women. And it also causes oral, oral pharyngeal cancer in both men and women, which is uh, includes the back of the throat, the tonsil area, um, and the part of the tongue. So moving forward, I kind of want, I would like to like ask a quick poll question um, and I kind of gave it away already, but if you feel, if you would like to uh, drop in the chat, if you think that it's true or false that HPV can cause cervical, vaginal, vulva, breast cancer and or pharyngeal cancer in women, um, let me know in the chat if you think that this is true or false. So I'm going to give a minute for everyone to to um to share actually i'm i'm not even certain that people can drop in the, in the chat um trixie do you know if people have the access to, the, to in the chat they should be hold on i'm gonna try to uh if not that's okay i can move forward i just wanted to no, see if i'm good all right how about now so um so someone said false okay what else do what else do our participants say? Anyone else think this is true or false? All right, so while um I let uh, some other folks um, write in. I'm just, just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but this is actually a trick question. So while HPV does cause cervical, vaginal, and vulvar cancer, as well as oropharyngeal cancer, it does not cause breast cancer. 
So when I'm educating the community and I'm educating my students, I always tell them that the cancer that uh, the cancers that HPV cause remain in the genital area as well as the mouth and throat area. So that's the way that I have them remember what type of cancers that HPV can cause. So it does not cause breast cancer, but it does cause all of the other cancers mentioned here. <clears throat> okay, so um, each year there are about 35,000 individuals diagnosed per year with HP-related cancer. This graphic here shows the number of individuals diagnosed with HP-related cancer. Um, per year, 14,000 um, people are diagnosed with oropharyngeal cancer. This surpasses the number of individuals diagnosed from cervical cancer, which is now 11,000. So as you can see, um, as you can see from the table here, um, the cervical precancer cases are very high, about 196,000 precancer um, diagnoses. And you can see here the other diagnoses for um, oropharyngeal cancer, which is 14,000, and oropharyngeal cancer is now the most diagnosed type of HPV-related cancer. And so, um, so oropharyngeal cancer is the most diagnosed one, then uh, cervical cancer following, anal cancer following that one, and vulvar and uh, vaginal cancer as well, followed by um, penile cancer. Now, talking a little bit about what the most common cancers are, the most common cancers are um, for women is cervical cancer. And then for men, it is the oropharyngeal cancer, also known as the mouth and throat cancer. And the way that the oropharyngeal cancer is diagnosed is that people will go into their dentist, they'll have sores, ulcers, cuts, scrapes, and um, the dentist will, will do a cancer um, kind of testing done. And then that's where they can uh, be diagnosed for oropharyngeal cancer. So again, for men, this is the most common uh, HP-related cancer. Now moving forward, um, unfortunately, there is no cure for HPV. At this point in time, there's no cure for HPV, but um, there is a vaccine that can prevent HP-related cancers, and it is over 90% effective. So um, one of those things that I would like to talk with you pa with parents about is, you know, being able to recognize and know the risk factors for what increases your chances or your teen's chances of contracting HPV. And so, of course, lack of knowledge, um, the less educated you are or the less educated your child is, the more likely they are to engage in unprotected sex with, with partners. Also, you know, making sure that you're that they or yourself are taking protective measures like using female or male condoms, decrease the likelihood for getting HPV or any um, other type of STI for that matter. Um, we know that, you know, at a young age, um, adolescents begin experimenting. Um, we know that this is, you know, they go off to college. And so we wanna make sure that they are being educated and that they, be, they are being protected is very important and a very crucial first step. And so um, another way, of course, is also to reduce the sexual the number of sexual partners. The more um, sexual partners, the higher the probability of contracting HPV. However, the best step that one can take in preventing one's own health and that in protecting, sorry, one's own health and the health of their child and adolescent is getting vaccinated. So again, this vaccine is over ninety percent effective in protecting you or um, and or your children from the HP related cancers and genital warts that it causes. So it's nearly 100% um, effective in preventing cervical, vaginal, and vulva precancers that, as we know, is very high in the United States, 196,000 diagnoses of um, cervical precancers. Um, once the vaccine is in use, it is monitored for safety and effectiveness. This is a vaccine that has been out on the market for many, many years now, approximately um, almost 20 years, and um, it's it's being provided all over the world. Um, it's something that we know that has prevented cancers already, and it has reduced the rates of all of those um, diagnoses that I have mentioned um, prior. So 
we are urging that as early as possible, it's best to vaccinate your child before they're exposed, um, before they have any type of sexual contact or any um, type of sexual experience, because the body would already know um, and protect them once that moment comes. So one thing that I always share with my parents, um, a lot of parents have the belief that they're going to wait for their child to um, become, you know, 18 years old so that they can get the vaccine on their own. And one thing that I always educate parents and my students is I tell them, well, if, um, if you vaccinate your child, if you wait to vaccinate your child when they become an adult, if they so happen to become sexually active before then, then they may already be exposed to HPV and the vaccine will no longer protect them from the strain that they were exposed to. So if they decide that they get their, they want to get their HPV shot after already having become um, sexually active and they were already exposed to a strain or two, the vaccine will no longer protect them from the strain that they um, were already exposed to. And so it is always best to vaccinate as early as possible because the more the earlier that is done, the more effective it is and the more the body is prepared to fight it off if exposed to any of the strains that HPV, um, to any of the HPV strains. And there's over 150 um, HPV strains out there. Now, um, moving forward to the different types of HPV vaccines. And so we, um, we have a bivalent vaccine, we have a quadrivalent vaccine, and we have a nivalent vaccine. We know that that just stands for the amount of strains that it protects against. Right now in the United States, we, we use the nivalent vaccines. And that, as you can see here, protects against, you know, very the many of the very harmful cancerous causing strains and the genital warts causing strains. So, you know, as you can see here, they are 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58 are um, some of the most dangerous strains that the, the HP vaccine protects against. Now, um, again, HPV the vaccine is a cancer prevention tool, right? We want to make sure that we are getting vaccinated so we can prevent cancer in ourselves and in our children. We recommend the vaccine for everyone between the ages of nine and 45. So it was originally um, approved up until the age of 26 years old, but as of the recent um, years, it has been approved up to the age of 45 on a case by case basis. So if you are older than 26 years old, you can speak to your provider and see if there are benefits to receive receiving the vaccine after that age. Um, of course, we know that um, it won't have the same efficacy as if you are a child, but it can still protect you against strains that you were not exposed to, even if you're in your 30s or your early 40s. So it's still an option for parents and um, for anyone who is between that age group. Um, it is given in um, two to three doses, depending on the age of initiation. And so typically it's given to 11 to 12 year old children. Um, it can be given as early as nine years old. And um, we recommend that it's done as early as possible. So starting at the age of nine is the best time for your child to get vaccinated. We do not want to wait until they are 13 and 14 or you know even older than that because then we risk our children becoming um, sexually active and then being exposed to HPV. Moving forward. So the way that the HP vaccine dosage, dosage is done is that um, between the ages of nine through 14, the child will only need two doses in total. And after their 15th birthday, if they have not yet initiated their vaccine um, schedule for HPV vaccine, then they will need three doses. The reason for that is, is while they are younger, their immune system is stronger and they're able to only need the two doses. And then as they get older, their immune system tends to weaken, needing that extra boost. The possible side effects of um, uh, the HP vaccine include pain or redness in the eject in the injection site. You know, tenderness. Um, the arm hurts. Fever, dizziness, or fainting. 
nausea, um, fatigue, muscle or joint pain. These are all very common side effects to just vaccines in general. And um, these are possible side effects for the HP vaccine. These are mild, they go away on their own and they do not last long. They shouldn't be a cause for concern and they should um, uh, disappear after a few, after a few days. Again, the best time to get the vaccine is um, between the ages of 9 and 12 because they have a greater immune response, meaning their bodies will produce more antibodies. Again, if you have any questions about anything that I am mentioning, you can feel free to drop it in the chat at any moment and I can get to it um, at the end. Another reason as well as to why we want to vaccinate as early as possible is when is because when children are younger, um, they can receive the vaccine for free or very low charge. But once they become older and become adults, um, insurance may not cover anymore. And recent years, it cost $300 to get the vaccine and maybe even more so in the most recent times. And so we can um, access the vaccine um, for very free and very low cost. And I will get into that in the next couple of slides of where you can go if you're interested in getting vaccinated. So I wanna ask um, another quick poll that I would, I would, if you can participate in the chat. So just to know, just to see if, you know, um, my, the information is being understood. If your child got their first vaccine at 14 and their second vaccine at 15, will they need another one? So drop in the chat if you think that your child will need another vaccine if they got their first one at 14 and their second at 15. If the chat is still disabled for you all, you can um, put it in the Q&A. Okay, so someone responded yes. So again, um, if they got their first vaccine before their 15th birthday, they will only need two in total. So if they're 14 and they got their first dose, they're only going to need one more dose, meaning that they're only going to need two in total. How? And then if, you know, if they started the vaccine series after the age of 15, then they're going to need three in total. I hope that... Um, that's uh that clarifies that confusion um but again if there are if they start the vac the vaccine series between the ages of 9 to 14 they will only need two and then if they initiate the vaccine series at 15 they will they are going to need three and um you know the way that it is done is that you know the child will get their first one Six to 12 months later, they'll, they'll get their second dose. And then six to 12 months later, if necessary, they'll get their third dose. Okay, moving forward. Thank you guys for participating in that chat, or in the poll, sorry. So reasons, uh, I wanna kind of talk a little bit about reasons that parents don't vaccinate their children. So first and foremost is the lack of knowledge, right? So parents um, may not know that one HPV can cause cancer. They don't know that HPV can cause genital warts. They um, may not know the benefits of receiving this vaccine. Um, and they just, you know, so ha uh, may many of the times they may not, you know, be able to speak to a, a professional who can educate on HPV and teach them about these dangers and about the dangers um, for their adolescents. Another reason is that it is not recommended, right? So they can go to their um, child's pediatrician or their own um, OBGYN and it's not being recommended to them. So while it can be available in their, um, in their doctor's office, um, it may not even be recommended by the provider. Um, it may be something that the provider, because it's not a required vaccine for school, that they may just skip over it and not really talk to the parent about. Um, and because of that, they, they assume that it's not needed or it's not necessary. But we know now the importance of receiving the vaccine. 
they may have um, safety concerns or, you know, they may have concerns about the side effects, but um, this vaccine we know is very safe. We know that it's been monitored. We know that um, over 160 million doses have been administered world worldwide and that um, number continues to increase. So it's something that we know that it's safe, it works, and it has prevented many cancers and genital warts. And then the last um, reason why parents may choose not to vaccinate is because they say that their children is not sexually active. And um, we now know that we want to make sure that we vaccinate our children before they become sexually active, because that way we can fully protect them from the strains that can cause the cancers and genital warts. Um, a piece of misinformation that also lingers is that um, parents don't think that boys need to be vaccinated for HPV. They assume that it's only an issue for girls. And so um, we know now that both boys and girls can get HPV, both boys and girls can get cancer, genital warts, and they can both, both boys and girls can get the vaccine. So we know that among males, the most common HPV associated cancer is the oropharyngeal cancer. And they, these rates are increasing um, for both boys, uh, for males and females. So um, oropharyngeal cancers that doctors previous, previously thought were caused by uh, tobacco use or alcohol use are now being identified as HPV-related cancers. So um, there are also, there's also, you know, a piece of information is that there's a report from the CDC that shows that addressing knowledge gaps among parents, as well as increasing clinician HPV vac vaccination recommendations are critical in protecting teens against HPV associated um, cancers and genital warts. So if I do have any um, providers or any healthcare um, or any healthcare physicians or providers here on this webinar, um, uh, that this is a, a recommendation to continue to recommend the HP vaccine to parents because it is critical um, in protecting your teens. And we know that parents do, um, do trust their providers with this information. Uh, now I'm getting to, I would like to talk a little bit about the New Jersey HP vaccine coverage rates. So as you can see on this graph, um, this graph shows national and state data um, collected from the CDC's annual national immunization survey. Um, and so the, it shows information about the meningococcal dose, the Tdap, HPV, and flu. Uh, both meningococcal and Tdap vaccines in New Jersey are above the national average, which is great. We want to have high rates in New Jersey. Um, and, you know, they have met the healthy people goal of 2020. And so as you can see the little red dots, that's the healthy people goal, the national healthy people 2020 goal. And we've exceeded that for meningococcal and Tdap in New Jersey, which is really great. Um, but as you can see, the HPV rates is much lower um, compared to Tdap and meningococcal. So the H HPV vaccine is recommended um, at you know, 11 or 12 years old, which is when teens are typically due for their Tdap and meningococcal vaccine. And so they will get the third, they will get the HPV, HPV shot along with their Tdap and meningococcal. So, um, which as you can see from the rates here on this graph, um, it is not being done as often as it should be done. So, um, you know, very low rates of, it, it can compare to the flu, as you can see, in terms of the ratings um, and percentages of how frequently um, New Jersey teens are being vaccinated. Another reason as to why there have been declines um, are also because of the COVID pandemic. So now on this slide, I'm going to get into that. So these are the New Jersey coverage rates for 2021, as you can see on this graph. Um, um, the 63% of female adolescents in New Jersey aged 13 to 17 are up to date with their um, HP vaccination. This is great. Um, 47 of male adolescents in New Jersey um, aged 13 to 17 are up to date with their HP vaccination. However, it was 59.2 last year. So it has decreased a lot 
Um, and, you know, even though 63% of, fe of for females is good, we want to see higher numbers. And so the healthy people goal for um, 2030 is 80% for both males and females for the three doses of HPV, which is not, which has not been reached. Um, it is currently at 548 but last year it was at 59.7. So um, unfortunately it has been slowly decreasing. And the reason, part of the reason for this is as I mentioned COVID, right? So we know that during COVID times, um, we, you know, we were told to stay home. We were told to not go to the hospital, not go to our, our doctor unless it was absolutely necessary. And, you know, students were also going to school um, remotely from home. And a lot of them were not getting vaccinated, were not getting their annual checkups, were not getting their annual vaccines, which in turn affected their HPV vaccine rates as well. So we're hope we're moving to try to get these rates to once again increase and have these rates um, move towards the Healthy People 2030 goal. So if you, you're probably, if you're asking yourself, where can I get the HP vaccine for myself or my child? Um, you can get it at your private um, or pediatrician's office. Again, a lot of the times they do provide the vaccine and they may not talk about it. So you can ask your, your provider yourself, hey, I'm interested in this vaccine. Um, I would like to know more. And then you can speak, have that conversation with your provider. You can also go to FQHCs, which stand for Federally Qualified Health Centers. You can also go to the Vaccines for Children um, VFC providers as well. You can go to the local health department and the New Jersey Department of Health Vaccine Preventable Disease Program. And um, the eligibility um, under this program is that the child um, is younger than 19, they are Medicaid eligible, they're un uninsured or underinsured. A little bit more specifics in terms of the Vaccines for Children program. And so um, those who, as I mentioned, who is eligible for the VAFC program, any child under 19, Medicaid eligible, uninsured or underinsured, where you can get the vaccine. So again, at your local health clinic, um, the vaccine can be provided at fairly qualified health center or rural health um, centers. Um, if you have any questions about getting your child vaccinated, ask your healthcare provider. This program um, is a federally funded state operated vaccine supply program that does provide pediatric um, vaccines at no cost to doctors who serve children who might not be otherwise enabled to um, not be able to pay. So there are over 1000 medical offices enrolled in the VFC program in New Jersey. Thank you for joining us. We kindly ask that you take a few minutes after today's um, webinar to complete the program survey. The link to the survey has been um, also been added to the chat for your convenience. And a special thank you to Yurani for dedicating your time and your expertise today. If you have additional questions or comments, you can send us an email to communityhealth at atlantichealth.org, or you can call 1-844-472-8499. This concludes our webinar. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.